A gente vai conversar agora com, falando um pouquinho sobre a eficiência de conversão e uso de busca dentro do site. Uh, vamos ter uma conversa com o Jason Miller. Jason, if you could join me here. Jason, vice-presidente de tecnologia da Motorcycle USA, responsável em todos os aspectos técnicos, incluindo desenvolvimento de software, análise, SEO, administração de rede, bacharelado em tecnologia da informação, vai apresentar para a gente site search, mark, making sure customers find the merchandise they want. Jason, if you could join me here on the stage. Salva de palmas, por favor. E para falar sobre conversion rate optimization, four pillars of building instant trust online, uh, eu queria convidar Tim Ash. Tim é autor do best-seller Page Optimization Landing, esse livro que eu tenho aqui. CEO da Site Turners, fez mestrado e doutorado em ciência da computação pela Califórnia San Diego. Uh, importante dizer que o Tim vai sortear um livro dele. Uh, e para isso, aqui na frente, bem nessa direção, a gente tem um lounge com sofás brancos ali, tem um carrinho de compras lá, vocês podem colocar seu cartão de visita. Tá? E às 19 horas uh, vai ter o sorteio do livro do Tim, para quem quiser participar. Tim, por favor. Bom dia, Sampa. Tudo bem? Okay. I just used up all of my Portuguese. Uh, I don't know anymore. No, I know uh, capoeira, carnaval, favela, that's it. No more. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about trust. Now, earlier, Yulia was talking about it in, in human relationships and forming human relationships. I want to explore that a little more. So I'm going to talk today about the four pillars of building trust online. But first, I want to give you a little bit about background about our company, because some of you may not know it. Uh, what we do is we help improve websites and landing pages. We make them more efficient. So I don't really care how you get traffic to your website or your landing page. I care about making people act once they get there. So that's our job. We work with large companies and small ones. We can help diagnose problems with your website uh, and fix them or come up with landing page test ideas. And we've worked with about a thousand clients. You may recognize some of them here. But today I want to talk about trust. Now, building trust in the real world is easy. Maybe if I wear this suit, you'll trust me more? Like you don't think I'll kill you? Okay, maybe you will, you'll never know. But, you know, you can look. I, I took a shower this morning, I got dressed up. You can judge somebody by the way they look and the way they act. But we can't do that online. Online, you're dealing with people you don't even see. They're invisible. They show up on your website, they click, they move around, they're probably gone. What do you know about them? Well, you could say, well, I know their browser resolution, and I know their operating system, but you don't know anything about the people. So building trust online is very hard. The first reason it's hard is that it has to be done very quickly. Do you know how long it takes someone to form a first impression of your landing page? One twentieth of a second. Fifty milliseconds. That's it. And that's your subconscious mind, and it makes decisions based on visual information very quickly. You can't fool it. You know when a website looks unprofessional. You know when it looks really good, too. But it happens very fast. Here's the second problem. You don't know anything about the people. So again, you know maybe about their browser environment variables, or their IP address, or technical crap like that but you don't know anything about them. What, what they had for breakfast that day, whether they just had a fight with their wife, uh, whether they like blue or red, you don't know anything, right? You don't know anything about them at all. So, there's also another problem, which is that they don't know you. Now, you can't do anything about the first problem, 
but you can do something about the second one. So what I'm going to try to do is help you understand how to get to know, how to let them know about you. So I'm going to talk about the four pillars of building trust online. These are universal principles that you can apply in any kind of trust situation, but I'm going to try to give you some concrete examples of how to do this and how not to do it, okay? Lots of ways not to do this. So the first pillar I want to talk about is appearance. Now again, I got dressed up because my public relations people tell me I have to do that every time I speak. You know, if I came like a slob and you know, was up here, you wouldn't think the same of me. Well, I'm not as handsome as that gentleman, but at least I can dress well. Okay. So appearance matters. We judge a book by its cover. Let me ask you a question. Would you buy a grand piano from this company? Anybody? Why are you laughing, sir? <laughs> they want you to buy $25,000 and higher pianos from them. From this website. Are you kidding me? Why would I do that? Well, maybe because they have two home buttons, one in each corner. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this site looks like it's a time warp back to 1995. And we don't trust it. Here's another one. I live in San Diego, California. It's a very boaty town. We have a lot of people that have yachts and boats. Would you buy a yacht from these people? No, look at it. Isn't it beautiful? I mean, hey, they have a picture of San Diego Harbor with all the boats in it. And they have an American flag. Come on. And you know what? That American flag is animated. It waves. Okay, sure, one million dollars, I'll pay them. Buy a yacht for me. How about these guys? Want to buy some barbells? Exercise equipment? No? Now normally, I would say something mean about the graphic designers that made this page. But looking at it, I just realized that there probably were no graphic designers involved in the making of this page at all. But we judge a book by its cover. So don't look like these sites. The standard on visual appearance and production quality of your websites and your landing pages is going up every day. And you have to keep up. So this is how not to get disqualified based on how you look. The first is the professionalism of your design. You have to do it right. You have to make a clean website. The second, this is more of a mental thing. You have to be very sparse and neat. Don't clutter everything up. Don't try to fill up all of the screens real estate, all of the space on your page. Leave white space. Leave room for me to breathe when I get to your site. And think clearly too. Organize the information. The first appearance has to do with organization and how clear you are and the choices you give me for what I can do on your site. All right, let's talk about the second pillar of building trust online, transactional assurances. Now, we're here at the e-commerce forum and you want to sell crap, right? Who wants to sell more crap? Translator, if you're translating this, do this right. Tell them, who wants to sell more crap? Say it. Okay, good. Now this is how not to do it. Here's a website, they want to sell stuff. But look at the trust symbols, they're on the bottom. I've highlighted them at the bottom of the page. Oops. So at the bottom of the page there, you can see them. Now, what percentage of your visitors do you think will see that trust? Anybody want to guess? How, how many percent are going to see that trust? One percent. No, higher. More than one. Five percent. No, higher. It, it used to be 5%, but now we all have the little wheels on our computer mouse. So now we, we're used to using them. So 15% will see those trust symbols. Okay, wait. Let me tell this to you another way. 85% of the people will not see them. Do you understand the math here? You're probably paying for those trust symbols, right? They're useless to you if they're invisible, if I never scroll down the page to see them. Here's another example. Now, this is a pet supply 
company in America. They have lots of big stores. And what do you normally see in the upper left corner of a website? What do you see in the upper left corner? Logo, right? The company logo. It anchors your experience. The question you ask yourself is, am I in the right place? Well, what did they put there in the upper left corner? A trust symbol. HackerSafe was a, was a safe shopping seal. It's now called McAfee Secure, okay? But they put that instead of their logo, breaking a very, very strong web convention. And instead, they made their logo super size and moved it to the middle of their header. But if you came to the site without looking at anything else, you should get this two-part message instantly. We're safe to shop with. We're pet smart, right? And after that, you can go shopping. But you're reassured about the safety of using their site. They're so proud of it that they put it ahead of their brand, ahead of their logo. That's a very powerful statement. You can do the same thing inside of your website. So below your at the cart button, you can have security seals and trust seals and safe buying assurances. All of these things, when I care about them, are really important. And if I'm thinking about adding something to my shopping cart, I care about the safety of your site. So that's exactly the time to make me want to trust you. Okay, so to relieve what I call point of sale or point of action anxieties, you need to do the following things. You need to tell them about how, you can, how they can pay you. Any payment terms, uh, delivery information, when will I get it? That's kind of important, isn't it? Data security and privacy, are you going to spam me with email from now on? What if I don't like it? Can I return it? That's really important stuff. So make sure that at the right time in the process, they know all of these things. Okay, pillar number three, authority. This is a universal pillar. Let me ask you a question. Let's say you have an appendix problem. Your appendix has to come out right now. Okay, imagine that. This doctor walks into the room. This guy walks into the room, okay? Would you trust him to remove your appendix? Yeah, I mean, he looks smart enough and he looks, you know, likable and he looks like he has some experience and he looks like he's not too old and his hand won't shake when he cuts you, right? Would you trust him? Raise your hand if you would trust him to do the surgery. Okay, you have to have it out. You have no choice, okay? Guys, that's not a doctor. It's a model. All he did was put on a doctor's smock and put a stethoscope around his neck. That's it. You with me? That guy never went to medical school, I promise you. He was doing underwear ads for Calvin Klein. Okay. But you trust them because of the uniform, and we do that. Would you trust a judge? Yeah. Is that a judge? No, it's, well, it actually, that's a real judge, but you could say it's also just a lady in a black robe, right? That's true, too, but we trust people in, in marks of authority. How about this guy? Would you listen to what he says? Yeah, and not just because he has the gun. He almost never has to use the gun because the uniform is enough. Okay, so how do you take these ideas and put them on your website? How do you make me trust you with authority. Well, here's an example. Um, this is one of our clients, a company called Real Age, and they had this quiz. If you answer some questions about your lifestyle, uh, whether you drink or smoke or exercise, and they will tell you your real age. So it's not your chronological age, but your biological age, how well you've maintained your body. Now, some of you may not want to know that <laughs> after partying tonight, I know, but take the quiz on Monday instead. Okay, so we had this very personal information they were asking for on this page, and we had to get people to fill out this, this quiz. So we added the trust symbols. Now, those are U.S. media outlets, and uh, you've probably seen or heard of some of them anyway. And um, just making that one change increased the percentage of people who took the quiz by 40%. Same people, same people showing up. 40% more of them will fill out the form. 
Here's another example. Now, this is business to business. This is another one of our clients, SF Video. And what they do is they do DVD duplication. CD, DVD, Blu-ray, large-scale copying, you know, for, for businesses, okay? So look at the size of the form on this page. This is a pay-per-click landing page for Google AdWords. Very small form. It says instant quote, okay? What's taking up most of the room on this page? What do you see here? Logos. Have you heard of any of these companies? Yeah, even down here in Brazil. In fact, Walmart presented twice today, right? I mean, and, and if you're thinking about, I need some DVDs duplicated, I bet you're thinking something like this. Wow, these guys work with Nike and Walmart and Microsoft. I really hope that they'll take a little itty bitty small duplication job like mine, right? And I hope they're not too expensive. Maybe you're thinking those things, but what you're not thinking is, can they do it? Because by putting those trust logos, you know that they can, right? And who thinks though that that's too many trust logos? That's crazy, too many. Raise your hand if you think that's, that's too much. Takes up too much of the page. Yeah, crazy. So we did a test and we left only six of them, the most important six in one column. That 58% improvement went away. You can never have too much trust. Put all of your big clients in there if you're selling to other businesses. Put media mentions in there if you're selling to consumers. Here's another example. Now this is, uh, this is a, a debt negotiation company, or actually they sell leads to companies that help you get out of debt. So they want people that have a lot of credit card debt. And look at this form, right? Uh, and look at their trust symbols. The trust symbols are on the bottom. So we did a test, we tested a lot of changes, and we had a winning page that had these trust symbols on the right. They're much more visible on the page, okay? And, you know, a lot of other things changed on this page, but I'll tell you something, you don't recognize any of those trust symbols. I'll tell you a secret, I don't either. Those are very specific industry associations that they belong to. This is not something that any consumer has ever heard of. But this is like the butterfly collection. You know how you have very pretty butterflies in a wooden box with glass in front? You know, it doesn't matter really if it's even a butterfly. It could be a really pretty moth. As long as you're putting it out there and you're saying, we're proud of this, it will have an effect. People look for pictures. They look for seals. They look for visual information that they can scan and decide whether they're going to stay on your page. Okay, here's another example of trust. Now, this is one of our clients, Credo Mobile, and they're a socially conscious kind of uh, liberal cell phone company. And if you switch to their plan, this was their landing page, they will give a percentage of their money to uh, charities. So we didn't like this page. We saw a lot of problems with it. We helped them redesign this new one. Okay, there it is. And you can say, oh, big deal. It's the middle of the afternoon, time for a nap, you know. It's just a more boring version of the old page. But what we did is we added trust. You see that? How many of you have heard of Credo Mobile? What, nobody? Yeah, we don't know about them in the US either. Okay, but how many of you have heard of Greenpeace? Okay, keep your hand up. How many of you have heard of uh, Doctors Without Borders? Also, yeah, one, one or the other. Or Planned Parenthood, this is an uh, organization in America. So. What you're doing is you're borrowing trust from these better known brands. So if you're associated with them, that means you're as good as them, right? So one of the things we did was we have this software called attentionwizard.com and you can try it out. Uh, what we do is we can, uh, you upload a picture, it doesn't even have to be of a live page, but just the above the fold portion of the page and you can see what someone's going to focus on, where the interesting parts of the page are during the first few seconds. And this is the heat map or attention heat map of the original page. Here's the new one. We worked very hard to put the attention on the phone, on the call to action button, and very importantly, on that Greenpeace logo because it's at the top of the list. Here, take a look. We actually made it darker so it would have more contrast and you would look there. Anybody want to guess? the difference between the performance of these two pages? Only 
Trust matters. Use it. Use it on all your pages. So borrow trust from better known brands, reviews, awards you've won, important clients if you're a business, media mentions, any associations you belong to, again, in the form of visual seals. This is very important stuff. Okay, and now I'm going to probably repeat a little bit of what's been said earlier, but we're social creatures. So the f number four pillar of building trust online is consensus of your peers. Uh, do you think these people care about what you think? Do they care about what you think? No. And you probably don't care about what they think unless they're pointing that shotgun at your head. Right? Well, it's like that. We care about what people in our group think, what people like us think. So in the e-commerce world, that's the form of reviews. Who knows more about this backpack? Whose opinion do I care about when I buy this backpack? Is it my mom's? No. It's other people that have bought this backpack. So when you have this information about the ratings and the reviews, this is very powerful um, social consensus. It's showing me that other people like this and have had a good outcome after buying it. Here's another example. I was listening to Pandora. It's internet radio. And, um, and when I'm listening to it, it says, do you want me to personalize this for you using Facebook? And I said, sure. So here I am listening to a track and it says, hey, your friend likes this artist too. Now, so what, right? Well, they want me to either pay $2, buy it, or they want me to vote it thumbs up or thumbs down to improve their recommendation engine, okay? And I'm three times more likely to do that if one of my friend's faces pops up on that page. And they know that and they use that. And you should too. Here's another example of social proof. I was thinking, uh, this is a while ago, of downloading the latest Firefox browser. And I got to this page, and, it's, and this was six weeks after this was released, and it said half a million people, sorry, half a billion people have downloaded this browser in six weeks. Wow, well, if I was thinking, should I download it? I think I have my answer. But they were even more clever. What they said was, look at all, every time someone downloads the browser on the map, we're gonna show where things light up. And I was in Germany at the time, and all around me, people are downloading this browser. Wow, I should download it too. So you support, automatic compliance with what you want by showing social proof. And you can do that in two ways. One is show me large numbers, and the other is show me people like me. The closer you can get them to be like me, the more I'll consider that important information. So if you like what I had to say, come to one of our conversion conference events. We have three in the US. The next one is in near Miami, Florida in October. We also have Germany and London, for those of you that go to Europe. And you're going to drink from the fire hose. You know, you won't be able to uh, get all the information we're giving to you. Uh, if you're interested in having us review your website, let us know. Uh, you can just go to our site and sign up. And uh, hopefully this is an incentive and not a problem, but I'll do the first five myself. So go ahead and sign up with a credit card, and then at the end, put, when we contact you, put e-commerce Brazil, and, and I'll know to do the first five. So that's all I have. Uh, very easy to reach me. And again, if you'd like to do the raffle for one of the books, go back there before 7 o'clock to the white couches and put your business card in. And at 7 o'clock, I'll draw for the books, and I'll sign them for you personally. So hopefully you got something out of that. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Now for the site search, making sure customers find the merchandise they want. Jason Miller, please. I'm losing my mic there, so. So I may be a little jet lagged. I'm 20 hours in from my flight and just landed. <laughs> so hopefully I make sense. The mic's dead. So a little bit about Motorcycle Superstore. Uh, we're a gear, apparel, parts, accessories for um, everything motorcycle. Uh, we're pretty much an e-commerce peer play, number 182 on the internet retailer IR list. Um, but one unique problem we have, and I'm sure 
a lot of other vendors have a similar problem when you carry a wide range of products as we have 150,000 active SKUs. So this sort of makes for an interesting e-commerce problem. So I agree with Tim's quotes, I, I love data. Uh, if you don't have data, you really don't know what you're working with. If you don't have some way to figure out what your users are trying to tell you. So I think it's really important to pay attention to how your users are interacting with your site. So this, this example here is using Web Trends Analytics and we're using heat maps. And the overlay of the heat maps gives you such a great impression of what your users are actually doing on your site while, while they're there. And we see all this data and all these people going in and using site search. And you see the hot, I think you can see it out there, the hot red spot on the site search. So each of those interactions gives us such a better place to learn about our users. So on our site, users, when they shop for apparel, are going to shop a really specific fashion compared to th protective gear, parts, accessories, and tires. So that's kind of the problem I'm going to go over that, the way we solve that and some of the benefits of that. So within our site search uh, with SLI, we were seeing a lot of results that really didn't make sense to us why people would search for these items. And what they were doing was they were actually searching for product-based tire sizes, rims, aspect ratios, things that we weren't really set up at that time to search for. And we realized that we needed to give our users a better way to find tires. So we worked and we built a tire finder. And what the tire finder does is it quickly gets the users right to the product they're looking for. So when they get on this page, they can just choose these items. They can be out in their shop looking at their tire and they can choose aspect ratio width boom, they get a whole department directly of those size tires for their specific bike. So by giving our users what they wanted, making it easier for them to find what they needed, we had a really positive response from the users. I uh, used another heat map as an example here. Users quickly figured out how this worked. It became the main way people browsed and searched for tires. We saw a 30% increase in tire sales. And right now, Motorcycle Superstore is the largest online distributor of tires in the US. So on the other side of the angle is gear and apparel, protective gear. We've got to come up with a good way for users to be able to find these items. And so I've used this example of a helmets page here. Just on this page alone, there's 29 different brands for this single page. 18 color choices, 674 items in these four styles. So to try to help the user navigate and find what they want quicker, we added in faceted navigation. If you can see there on the left, we've got the ability to quickly sort and filter down as they go in by color, by brand, by any options they need to. We also know that some users really want to be quick and not go to the item page, so we added a quick add to cart functionality. This allows it to pop up and actually add the item right there to your cart without having to go to an item specific page. So by doing that, we added in, and we did a lot of A-B testing. We used a, a platform called Optimize in the back end, and we did this badging. I feel like I'm, I sounds really loud back there. So we have badging. Is that better? OK. So we have the badging on here. And we tested different badging, different placements, and this badging won out the highest percentage of click-through. We also noticed we increased all the click-through rates when we added in the user reviews. Everybody wants to know what their customers are talking about, just like Tim was pointing out. So adding in the customer reviews on those products, side by side with products in the same department that don't have reviews, always a higher click-through rate on those products with a review. Getting the price up there and right in front of them. And then something else we've done is we do a lot of big closeout deals for motorcycle gear. So we'll have people who just want to shop those closeout deals. So they'll come directly, flip that tab there, be looking at the closeout deals. Always trying to make that process, you, you spend a lot of marketing time and money to get that person to your site. You want to try to make that the most optimal experience once they land there. The other thing we did is we matched our functionality between our site search and our department pages and our navigation so that the user has a seamless experience between the two. So our SLI search template matches up directly with what we're doing in our department pages so there's no confusion to our customer. We get the most robust faceted searching down the side. We still carry over our badging and our reviews, and then we add merchandising banners for sales and closeout things that are specific to this search functionality. By doing that, 
we increased the conversion of the users going through search by 5%. So something else we've done, we have a lot of general terms in our, in our particular industry. So someone might just search for a brand helmet. So if they just come to this page and they search for HJC brand helmet, we don't really have a good place to send them unless they want to see all the helmets related to that because there's dirt helmets and street helmets and all these variants. So what we do is as inside a search, we set up a, a specific landing page and we redirect them right to a page made for HJC helmets so that we can get them to where they need to go. So they can see quickly that, oh, well, I need to choose a, a street helmet if I'm riding a street bike or a dirt helmet if I'm riding a dirt bike. Another interesting thing we've done in the in nature of getting your customers quicker to the product they're trying to find is I've got a picture here on the, on the left that shows rich auto complete. So as the person's typing in that search term, we're trying to give them the most relevant product to that item on the site without even having to send them to search so that they can just click down in there and go directly to the product. So talking about getting people to come to your site via natural search, pay per click, you're spending a lot of time and money optimizing those pages, trying to get them to rank in Google. Um, so something we've done is we do a lot of optimization on our long tail terms, but a problem you run into is you can't always control the page Google's gonna wanna have for a particular term. So we found that we can dynamically include the most popular items based on the search term the person's landing on within that page. So what we do is we grab the search term as it's coming in via Google, and we run it through our SLI search and pull up the most top ranked items for that particular search. And then we dynamically insert that at the top of the page. This gives the user the ability to, if they're coming in, it's the first time they've seen our site, to actually see a whole range of products on that page that are similar to what they're looking for. Where else this becomes useful is in our particular, when you have a lot of, when you have clothing lines and things that they outdate, um, so they get discontinued or whatever. You don't want to necessarily take those off your site and lose that search engine ranking, but now we can offer the customer coming in, we, we offer them a, a rich relevance recommendation down there, but we also offer them the most high ranked items out of SLI search on that same page. So we kind of get a double whammy on that page and we don't lose that page for our SEO. So that's gear, tires, and now we have parts. And I've seen a lot of motorcycles on my way in here today, so probably a, a lot of people have had this problem. But when you go to buy parts, one specific part will fit many, many bikes. Uh, this, this example here, this clutch plate, 20 different bikes fit this. So how do I get that communicated successfully to a customer so that they can get the right product, cut down on returns, and be a happy conversion? That's kind of far away to see. So what we did is we came up with we have bike-based departments. We have specific parts finder within that, and within that drop-down is names of all the manufacturers of the bikes. This gives people the ability to quickly dig down in and choose their particular bike, their model year, and it brings up a department page, much like the department pages for gear and apparel now, but it's only dedicated to these particular parts that fit their bike. So they know now they know everything they're looking at fits their bike. There's no confusion, and they don't make mistakes. We take the same idea throughout our item pages and we carry through the already chosen bike and make sure that they realize that it's already chosen and they're looking at only parts for that specific bike. And you can see that via the arrow with the edit button there showing you've chosen your bike, here's what it is. Once again, to reduce customer confusion and make sure they're getting to the product they want to get to. So after doing that, we saw an increase in part sales, 197%. We continue to carry this through our checkout. It's reduced our returns, and it's reduced a lot of customer confusion on getting the wrong parts for their bike. A funny side note here that people would try to do is sometimes for multiple models of bikes, you'll find that one part is more expensive for the Honda than the Kawasaki, and people would try to be sneaky and go in and change their bike and flip it back to the less expensive part that looks like it'll work, and then they're unhappy when they get it. So we continued to carry this through and show them exactly the bike they've chosen it for all the way through the process, all the way through checkout, so that even if they think they're trying to save a couple bucks, they're going to get the wrong part. So taking it all mobile, we knew mobile was going to be 
something that was important to us and we knew that search was going to be important to it based on heat maps and everything we'd done before. So once again, the goal to keep customer confusion down is to make the mobile look exactly like your regular, your search and your mobile look exactly alike. So you give them the same rich experience, but you keep load times down. This is a, a, a WebTrends mobile heat map showing that search activity and how many people hop onto the mobile app and immediately search for whatever article or product they're searching for. This is our magazine site. We actually have an enthusiast magazine site, and that's the mobile site for it. So in, 20, in 2010, we launched mobile site sales, quickly gain momentum. It was kind of funny because we really didn't expect it to be as big as it would be. We thought a lot more people would browse than buy, but there seems to be a, a large demographic of people who are more than willing to purchase on their phone. Um, obviously, smartphones dominate the usage. And we started adding features like Super Deal of the Day and special closeouts that were only available on mobile, and this helped drive more people to try out our mobile. So we made sure that search was quick and easy, get the users to the products they want quickly, provide product refinements on the page, on mobile in the department so that they, this works exactly like the main site so that you can choose color and brand and everything and dial the, your search dimensions right down. Something we noticed as we got more into mobile are email campaigns and this kind of brings up a weird point is you don't really think about how many people are going to open your, your mail on a mobile device. Maybe they're going to later on go home and look at it on their desktop, but their first impression is going to be on that mobile device and what they think. But we also saw a lot of people clicking through via their emails. And we don't have, in this case, we didn't have a lot of great pages optimized for these people to mobilely land on because they were going to the full site instead of the, the mobile site. So our options at this point in time were we redirect them to a blank mobile site homepage or we let them just land on the full site. So we implemented Akamai's mobile detect and redirect product. And pretty much what this allows us to do is take that user's inbound request for a page, look at their user agent at the time it's coming into us, and translate that directly to our MDOT site on the exact page they should have landed on the, on the main site. So what that does is you have a search term like the Showy RF 1000 helmet. This user would have generally been redirected to a large page and not mobile optimized page. Well, with that in place, we're redirecting them directly to the product they search for. And year over year, 2010, 2011, we had 200% increase in mobile channel sales. So I think a big part of it, listen to your customers, like Tim was pointing out. I think you got to do a lot of A-B testing. I, I don't know if anyone's heard of the, uh, Eric's not here, so I, Eric, our marketing guy, I can use his term, but it's the, the hippo effect, is you, you can't let the highest paid person in the room make the decision all the time. You've got to have data and you've got to have analytics and you've got to prove the process out so that you know the, the process you're following is the actual, the correct process. And then strive to make your website work the way users want but you've still got to guide them to the most efficient methods. Keep the functionality between your different ways of navigating and searching the site, looking and feeling the same so that users don't get confused. And then optimizing your site's a constant process and no single method works for everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. I uh, just want to round up with a couple of questions. We are running out of time here. So Jason, if I might, uh, you mentioned some of the metrics around the, the way that you manage search. Now, could you point out from, from other possibilities of what to measure and how to adapt your search or how to better tune it from what the customer and to how to better read what the customer is trying to reach or trying to find? Uh, is there something that you say it would be the starting point for someone that wants to better make, to make better use of the search he already has. Well, I mean, for example, we use the learning search so that as users are in there clicking things, it's bubbling up those results to the top. Um, another thing I didn't touch on that, that kind of the definite learning search methodology is the site champion product that we use for SEO. And I had one of the slides in there showed one of the search results, but it's pretty much building search results pages based on user queries so that we've got real long tail keywords that are user generated. Um, 
and those work really, really well for us. And then you're, you're, you're getting products you never would have thought or the naming conventions customers would have never really thought. Um, and then we pretty much, any concept we come up with a, a big change, we A-B that test. So um, for departments and search, for example, we actually did the layouts with descriptions with them and only showing a fewer products with that grid layout that there are now, and we A-B tested that. And there, there's so many possibilities of places you can start for the A-B testing. And I'd like to add a couple of things to that. If you're just gonna start fixing your site search, the first place I'd look is, what are your most popular keywords? And actually look at the pages where that traffic is landing. Close. Yeah, I think you'll be shocked at some of the places on your site where that's going. And then the other thing is look at your so the search results page that says we, we didn't find anything, your zero search results page, usually that's a default template of some kind and some you know, programmer wrote it and it says, sorry, your search did not work. Well, that's very friendly, so fix that too. So. Excellent. And Tim, uh, a lot of our retailers are just starting their e-commerce approach and Brazil is going through a stage where a lot of small business are starting to become online as an opportunity as something that is more reachable than it was before and uh, for them what would you say that on building trust on appearing professional on making the right impress uh, the right uh, acquiring the right image from their customer perspective what would be the first easy steps to take based on what you showed us on the four pillars uh, well, I think that uh, I, I like uh, the, the notion that, that Jason just talked about of uh, if it's a natural search landing page, for example, to treat every page on your site as a landing page. So again, think of that. That's your front door. That's what they're going to walk through. So what you want to do is give them context. So if you only have trust on your home page, that's not enough. If it's a first-time visitor, you need to have some trust on every interior page too so that they see that. Excellent. Jason, Jim, thank you very much. Salva de palmas, por favor. Thank you.